This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today we have a Cosmic Queries edition from our portfolio of Let's Make America Smart Again. Wise the, up, America. <laughs> the topic today, vaccines. And we have one of the world's most knowledgeable people on the intersection of vaccines and the public's reaction to it. Lori Garrett. Lori, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you. Thanks for, we, this is not your first rodeo. Nope. You've, you're your third time with us. Yep. I had you for one. Bill Nye had you for another. Yeah. The first time I think we talked about the um, uh, zombie apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Bill Nye, you talked about Ebola. Right. So this time we're talking about vaccines. So thanks for coming back. You bet. And my co-host, first timer. Yeah, I'm excited. Let me get your name right here. Felicia Madison. You got it. Felicia, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you for having me. You're a stand-up comedian and a producer of comedy. I am. That's a wonderful thing. And you also uh, made sure to remind me you're a mom. I am. Of three three kids. kids, Plus, you're married to a fourth kid. That, that's your My husband. big baby. <laughs> your biggest, the biggest baby. <laughs> My big baby. Gotta love him. <laughs> and um, you, you produce, what is Laughing Affairs? What is that? It's a company that produces comedy shows for okay. corporations. I do a lot of charity event. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay. All right. We'll keep looking for you out there. If you want to have an affair, make sure it's a laughing one. Oh, very nice. <laughs> Tagline. So this is Cosmic Queries. We've solicited questions from our audience on the topic of vaccines which is always in the news, especially lately. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. And, and uh, Lori, you're here to set the record straight. And to, let me remind people, if I did my homework right, you won a Pulitzer Prize for your coverage of the Ebola virus. I did. As a, as a science journalist. And right now you're with, um, uh, what's the magazine? Foreign Policy. With foreign Policy. And you're a science journalist for foreign policy. Mm. This is great. We need more science journalists out there who tell it like it is, not how people want it to be. Yeah. Ooh, that, oh, that she looks really upset. <laughs> 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 what are you doing here? Get back out there and keep working. Yeah. Yeah. Tough All job. Right. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> so, Felicia, what questions do you have okay, for us? Okay, our first question is from Kila Kelia Silvis from Patreon. Patreon. Yeah. You're just kissing ass there. Yeah, you know we love Patreon. Right, right. They, um, they, they, I think if you're a Patreon member, you, we, we read your question first. They got to go first. They That's go what first. they're for. So mm-hmm. I'm Kelia Silvis, not me, but she's saying that. A neuroscientist from Minneapolis, Minnesota. What public health policy recommendations would you recommend to combat the growing anti-vax movement? Mm. Well, first, yes, the movement is growing unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there are more anti-vax people today than there were five years ago, 10 years ago, what have you. Um, And that's bad news. Um, The problem is that more and more of the anti-vaccine movement is not specific to vaccines. It's actually more an anti-government movement, a lack of trust in governance, which extends to include science and scientific admonishments that may come from government sources, whether it's public health leaders or, you know, organized medicine, what have you. And it makes the battle of fighting this uh, inappropriate, incorrect um, perspective about the role of vaccines in saving lives. It makes fighting it very, very difficult because you're not really fighting to the message. You're fighting to a larger social problem, a larger political problem that very few people in public health are prepared to address. They don't have the skills, they're very uncomfortable with politics, very uncomfortable with talking about, you know, why, why, for example, is the anti-vaccine movement on one side, that would be the sort of Texas, Missouri, Deep South side, very tightly linked to Donald Trump and his politics, whereas the anti-vaccine movement on the other side, that would be places like Seattle, Portland, Northern California, very tightly linked to kind of a suspicion of government and drug companies coming from a sort of whole earth catalog place. How do you reconcile those and fight both of them? How do you deal with the fact that in Italy, the Five Star Movement, a decidedly populist, very right wing movement, has taken over the Italian government and they are, as part of their platform, opposed to all vaccines? How do you deal with the fact that one of the rising right-wing populist movements of France 
has as part of its catalog opposition to vaccines. So, Laura, we, you're bumming us out here. I know, I'm sorry. The question was, what solutions do you have? <laughs> and you just said it's worse than we ever thought and we should just give up. Well, if it were simply- I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You just said I, give up. I know. I, well, I didn't. But, Fisher, did she, she said give she up. Did. She, she did. But, <laughs> but, but my point is we had- a moment of opportunity maybe 10 years ago when opposition was really about dealing with the facts. It was really about addressing specific concerns people had about vaccines. And today it's more and more disconnected from any kind of fact base at all and has more to do with kind of general political suspicions. We're asking you for a solution here. So, I mean, if we do want to address the facts and we do want to get people on board, um, you know, one of the big problems we have to deal with in rich countries like the United States is that most people haven't really seen someone with measles. They haven't really seen a Ooh. child face diphtheria. They haven't Ooh. actually seen any of these diseases. And so they've grown very nonchalant about it. And it's easy to get cavalier. We even had uh, uh, Darla Shine, who's the wife of the White House communications director, Bill Shine, who has been tweeting that it's good for you to have measles. You should get your children exposed to all these and they should get sick with all of them because she, who of course has no medical training, falsely claims that they protect you from cancer. So we have all kinds of disinformation out there that should, needs to be constantly countered. And we have a fantastic toolkit available for multiple sites, online, books, etc., to help you know how to give the correct information regarding the efficacy of vaccines and their safety. It's, it's, that, it's that famous, so, so you use an anti-dandruff shampoo and I come to you and I say, why do you use an anti-dandruff shampoo? You don't have any dandruff. <laughs> <laughs> right? So do you just have poster children who are completely infected with vaccine preventable diseases and say this could be your kid? Well, one of the things that has been happening is more and more parents of children with cancer are coming forward, going online, going on Facebook and so on and saying, please vaccinate your children because my child's immune system has been devastated. Mm -hmm. And if your child is a carrier, my child will die. Right. And, we have, at that point, it becomes a very serious public health thing because it doesn't affect you alone. It affects other people. That's right. Because it's about herd immunity. So mm -hmm. this is the other herd reason. Immunity. Herd immunity. So this is the other reason that it gets so balled up with politics. Because what public health is really saying to the masses out there is, hey, if 98% of you get a measles vaccine properly and your booster properly, then the good news is the whole society is protected. The herd is immune. Mm -hmm. Because for measles, which is the most contagious human pathogen there is, uh, we need about a 98% level of immune protection to protect the whole herd. So that child with cancer, for example, is protected if 98% of the other kids have been immunized. Mm -hmm. But if as soon as that herd immunity falls gets down. And in some parts of the United States where resistance is high, people oppose vaccines, it's down to the 50% level, wow. you know, which is insane, mm -hmm. which is zero herd immunity. Mm -hmm. This is only individual immunity. But presumably there are other kinds of uh, diseases that don't require 98% That's right. uh, vac uh, protection. Uh, Influenza. Influenza. Is that 50% protection? Because it cuts off, <clears throat> it cuts off, if, if you have half the exposure and these are not people you're necessarily close to, you can get through it without catching it. Right. Is that the, the, that's yeah. how that works. Yeah. It has, that's why it has, I don't get it, the flu vaccine. Well, no, there's a thing. Well, you should, but that's another story. <laughs> I figure but, all my friends are doing it, so I'm not going to get it, so I'm, I'm covered. Well, we have, we have this, I, this concept of reproductive rate, and that has to do with if, if, you have the flu and you're coughing and you're sick in this room right now, which better not be true, uh, <laughs> then you, odds are statistically, would infect three people in this room as a matter of pure statistics. So the reproductive rate is three. If it's measles, the reproductive rate is 15 to 18. 
So people in a crowded room. Yeah. Okay, so okay. in other words, you know, there are how many of us here in this room right now? Five. So st- just purely statistically speaking, if I had measles and you folks weren't vaccinated, every one of you would get measles from being in this room with mm-hmm. me. And here's another way of looking at it. Measles, one of the things that makes its reproductive rate so horrible is it's airborne and the virus can linger in a space and successfully infect somebody who comes in later. Mm. I can leave this room, Anil's office and you, is a site of contagion for everybody else that walks in. You can leave this room and yet you'll still be here. I'll still be here. <laughs> <laughs> Lingering on. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, next question. Okay, Thank now, you. We'll do All another right. Patreon one right now All from right. Brett LaRue. In the future, if we were able to travel to other planets with a breathable atmosphere, what would be the steps to vaccinate against the unknown dangers? Ooh. Ooh. You know Ooh. who first thought about that? Joshua Letterberg, who was a Nobel laureate, one of the greats, uh, was at Rockefeller University for many years. Um, and he thought about it when he was, one. Of, I think at the time, the youngest Nobel laureate in history. I think he was like 33 or 34, something unbelievable. And I think Marie Curie was pretty young, yeah. too, I think. Well, and he had uh, you know, discovered the first examples of antibiotic resistance. So one of the things Josh Letterberg said was, wow, we're sending men to the moon. What if we, un, you know, unwittingly took our microbes to the moon with those men to the moon mm-hmm. and infected a life form if there is any on the moon? Or conversely, what if there is some kind of microbial life on the moon and those guys bring it back with them? Right. Scarier. So so that was the beginning of uh, Michael Crichton's uh, book Andromeda Strain. Loved the book and the movie. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, that has been a constant question. Just for those who didn't know, in the Andromeda Strain, there is a space probe that returns to Earth, but it had been contaminated by a space virus. Right. And it basically killed everyone in the town where this thing landed. And it became a major public health issue. How to deal with it, what they're doing, why. Was it militarized? Was it a project? What was going on? So, uh, very, a fascinating topic. Michael Crichton, the same author of uh, Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so that's that prompted NASA to look at this problem, and it's been constantly revisiting the problem. And in fact, in the current space station, now well, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole microbiome. division of NASA, the, the uh, division of planetary protection, where you protect where you're going and you protect Earth coming back right just in response to this yeah right. so, uh-huh, uh-huh. and in the current um space station you know we had the twins the twin brothers the kelly's who were identical we've had one tw- on star talk yes i don't know which one it was <laughs> the, one who's, the one who's running for senate or okay. no no we had the, the better looking scott, one apparently scott oh, <laughs> God. Well, one of them was in space and was the longest american Scott, Ke- Scott Kelly, Scott. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and it, while his brother was on Earth, and one of the things they did was test their own microbiome every single day, so that on Earth, we're, one is to keeping track of what microbes are inside his body, and in space, the other's keeping track of his, mm-hmm. and you saw an actual clear change wow. in space. While it's possible for an invading species, an invading virus or bacterium to completely take out an, a whole population that has no immunity to it, such as what happened when the explorers went back and forth from Europe to North America and back, mm-hmm. all right? There was smallpox, there was, um, what's the other one? Um, well, influenza, smallpox, syphilis, all syphilis, of Syphilis, yes, syphilis actually went back to Europe, right? So, so there's, and then it infects people. But the difference is, there are human beings on both sides of the ocean, right? So an interesting point of safety is, can you catch a disease that has no experience in your species at all? Right. Like, so for example, can, can an oak tree catch whooping cough? Answer no. No. <laughs> and, and, Maybe the Wizard of Oz trees can right. catch whooping cough. Well, <laughs> and, the, and another, way of, another way of asking that is, um, why do we assume that a foreign life form, an alien life form, would have a four base pair DNA construct? Exactly. Yeah, the, the kinds of biochemistry to match and marry with our biochemistry so that anything can happen at all. So, right. So it may be safer than we otherwise thought, but I'd rather be on the safest side 
by putting in these precautions. And of course, um, the uh, 2019, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing, when they came back, they were put in quarantine uh, in a little, uh, uh, what do you call the, it's not a Winnebago, what do you call it? Quonset hut. No, the, it was a silver version. What do you call the silver ones? Um, oh. Uh, not the jet stream. I love this game, Alzheimer's <laughs> Ray. <laughs> jet stream, it's a something stream. Gulf Stream. No. Airstream. No. Airstream. 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 Thank you. Airstream. Thank Bingo. you. Yeah. So I think they were in an Airstream. <laughs> there they were crowded near the little window looking out to have a conversation with yeah. people just to keep them quarantined. And I, what always worried me was, well, wait a minute. They had to get into that somehow. Yeah, how'd they get there? Yeah, mm -hmm. how'd they get there? <laughs> well, the other side... What, what steps did they take? Yeah. <laughs> well, the other side was War of the Worlds. The premise was what saved the world was that the invader got infected by an earthly virus. Exactly. Exactly. Do, 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 yeah, do, this do, is taking a creepy turn. In, in fact, <laughs> wait, wait. So funny you mentioned War of the Worlds. I keep with me a quote from the original book that summarizes the entire story. And if you, with your permission, I will read it. Please do. As we take out this first segment of Star Talk Cosmic Queries, Let's Make America Smart Again. For so it had come about, as indeed I and many men might have foreseen, had not terror and disaster blinded our minds. These germs of disease have taken toll of humanity since the beginning of things, taken toll of our pre-human ancestors since life began here. But by virtue of this natural selection of our kind, we have developed resisting power. To no germs do we succumb without a struggle, and to many, those that cause Putrefaction in dead matter, for instance, our living forms are altogether immune. But there are no bacteria on Mars. And directly, these invaders arrived. Directly, they drank and fed. Our microscopic allies began to work their overthrow. Already when I watched them, they were irrevocably doomed, dying and rotting even as they went to and fro. It was inevitable. By the toll of a billion deaths, man has bought his birthright of this earth, and it is his against all comers. It would still be his were the Martians ten times as mighty as they are, for neither do men live nor die in vain. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Chills. Ooh. Chills. Ooh. Ooh, this novel was written after the astronomer Percival Lowell reported that he believed he saw canals on the surface of Mars and published them. And this was headline news. There are Martians up there. H.G. Wells says, I will make some money off of that. <laughs> out came War of the Worlds. A year later, two years later, out came the novel. When we come back, more of Cosmic Queries, the vaccine edition on Star Talk. We're back on Star Talk. Let's make America smart again. Cosmic Queries edition. Vaccines. Lori Garrett, vaccine professional extraordinaire. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just, it's not so much vaccines as you're just good about all diseases. Yeah. <laughs> How's that go at the bar? <laughs> yeah. What's your specialty? Infectious diseases. What's your? <laughs> well, That's the a good pickup line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the best way to kill romance is to just start talking about deadly pathogens. Deadly pathogens. Yeah. Felicia Madison, come on down. What's the next question? The next contestant is Thel Jacques on Twitter. What is the main driver that causes parents not to vaccinate their children these days? Well, it's, today the number one driver. What would that be? Um, doubting the safety of the vaccines themselves. Okay, and wasn't there a time when some people refused them on religious grounds? That continues, that's ongoing. Okay. And, and right, right now we have an outbreak in New York City that's among Hasidic Jews because there's a very high level of opposition religiously okay. to vaccines. And our nation has always respected religious rules, provided that didn't infringe on other people's freedoms. So, are they more likely to, is a public health agency more likely to allow a religious person to not vaccine rather than someone who just fears the vaccine? Well, you know, the thing is, the religious objections, it was like less than 1% of the population, so oh. that was okay. Mm -hmm. But now 17 states have created a category called philosophical objection. Ooh. And that means pretty much any, anybody. It's the catch basin of any argument you have. Yeah. Wow. Okay. 
Sounds like something my kids are going to say to me. <laughs> yeah, mom, I hate shots. Yeah. No, no, I'm no, philosophically no. against needles. Yeah, if your kid says, I'm philosophically object, it's like, that's kind of like, you have no rebuttal to that because they've thought about it. They just don't want to go to school. <laughs> philosophically <laughs> object to school. Because you have to fill out these forms. You can't go to school if you don't get the vaccines. That's right. Depending on the state you live in. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Is there a state that is most egregious in this matter? Well, Texas is way up there. So mm. state of Washington is way up there, although they're now, because of their current measles outbreak, state of Washington has a bill before the state legislature supported by the governor that would eliminate the philosophical objection. So what you're saying is, echoing how we started this, this show, people now see their kids and their friends have measles, they're more likely to vote differently than if you live in a world with no measles. So Disneyland, 2014, Mickey Mouse et al., measles. It spreads because of a visitor who's infected and all the not vaccinated people in Disneyland then disperse all over the country. California at that time had philosophical objection possibilities. The state boomerang, the legislature and the governor all said, okay, we eliminate all this. You can't go to school unless you're vaccinated. Now, California has one of the lowest rates mm. of vaccine-preventable disease in the nation. Mm. So it just took a real example. Took a real example. Sounds like you need a better PR campaign. You know, it's... You know what you need? You need, <sighs> you need Mr. Measles. <laughs> Mickey Measles. <laughs> Mickey Measles, right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I mean, just to be sober for a moment, I'm one of the few people that could say, as an American... I've actually held a child in my arms that died of measles in my arms. Ooh. There's very few people in my generation and certainly in younger generations that have ever even seen the disease. And doctors today have a hard time diagnosing diphtheria or whooping cough or, uh, you know, even chicken pox. They, they, they just haven't seen them. And it creates a lot of resistance in the public mind. You know, my favorite objection, which I have often heard, is, you know, it's not that I think there's anything... You mean the most laughable objection? No. It's, it's, the, it's the one that's kind of the in chic vogue at the moment, okay? okay? It's, it's not that there's anything specifically, some nasty chemical, in the vaccine. It's just that they're giving too many vaccines. My children can't take so many. They need to space them out more. They can't, you know, and I always say, look, a baby has only two jobs. Two jobs. One, look at everything and listen to everything to finish the hardwiring of your brain and to learn language and, you know, what's going on in your world. And the second job, pick everything up and stick it in your mouth. Lick it. <laughs> slobber all over it. Grab another kid. Slobber all over them. You're programming your immune system. In any given day, a kid is picking up more junk off the floor and throwing it in to program their immune system than is contained in all the various shots they will have for their entire life. Nowadays, infants aren't getting all that, though, because parents are crazy. But if what we know is if you don't do the grovel on the floor right. and stick the dirt in your face, you end up with asthma. You end up with autoimmune diseases because you've never properly got your immune system knowing what is foreign and what is friend. My sister uh, has a barn. And she makes sure when they had their kid, had the kid crawl around the floor of the bar. Yeah. <laughs> he's not, he doesn't get sick. He, he has, he's, he, the guy, all his friends have all these allergies. He's got no allergies. What? I wonder the, if third children are healthier than first children because of that. Oh, yeah. Well, everyone well, always lets their, nothing right. touches the first kid, but the third kid, ugh. Right, right you're, then you're, the you're, parents are like, go whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we should study that. Felicia, next one. Next question. Okay, Alana from StarTalkRadio.net. I understand that science points to the benefits of vaccines, but there is still so much fear and disbelief as to the benefits versus harm. I would like to know why they use the chemicals and preservatives they use. Aluminum formaldehyde, coloring, polysorbate, why that? Why haven't they moved forward with better vaccine technology? And what is the real statistics around the effectiveness versus injury in children and adults? Ooh. Long question. <laughs> well, let me take the preservatives part because that is the objection that has been most commonly raised amongst those that fear there's a contaminant. 
that will poison their child. And then separate from the vaccine itself. Yeah. Okay. That's used because you want the vaccine to be stored. Mm-hmm. You don't want to have to make it every day. Right. Right. right? You, and especially when you're going overseas into humid, hot climates and so on, you need, you need a vaccine to be able to withstand a range of temperatures and so on. Um, in the past, um, we're talking 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Uh, there were some preservatives used that contain mercury, um, methyl mercury, and ethyl mercury. Uh, and there were some that contained. That's the mercury family. Uh, <laughs> say, Ethel. Uh, Ethel's a good friend of mine. Ethel. <laughs> <laughs> is Joey Mercury? This is Ethel Mercury. Okay. And, right. and there were, uh, you know, other preservatives used, but they've been greatly, greatly reduced. And in fact, all the mercury containing ones were banned by the FDA quite a long time ago. And worldwide, mostly what's done um, has more to do with the storage and how you store the vaccines than what preservatives you put in the vaccine. So we've greatly reduced all of those threats. Isn't it true that some percent of children who are vaccine, who receive a vaccine, will have an adverse effect? What percent is that? It depends on the vaccine Mm -hmm. um, and on the child's health at the time they receive a vaccine. And also what you're calling an adverse effect. A lot of people get a swollen arm wherever Mm -hmm. they get injected. Is that an adverse effect? Well, not one that anybody should be worried about. Right. Um, Swollen arm that that unswells after time. Yeah. Yes, okay. And a a child may complain of a headache. Did they have Mm -hmm. the headache already before they got vaccinated? Did the vaccine give them a headache? Or was it the experience of screaming in the doctor's office that gave them a headache? Um, Gives me a headache. But the adverse (laughs) events... Are, are, Did it give you a lollipop when you finish? <laughs> no, no, it's my kids screaming that gives me a headache when they get the shot. But the adverse events problem is very, 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 very low. Well, this is a scientific program, so I'm interested in you quantifying the well, five varies. The, the, the problem is it, it, it's based on the vaccine, mm-hmm. the specific, so it varies widely. Does any percentage of the kids die? The only deaths that we've seen associated with vaccines have been, at least in contemporary time, have been with inappropriately manufactured products in oh. India and China. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, China has reached a point where they've, they've made so many bad batches of vaccine that have harmed so many children that now they've had public executions of vaccine makers. They've imprisoned wow. vaccine wow. makers. Mm-hmm. And a lot of parents are refusing to use locally made vaccines and are trying to get American vaccines for their wow. children. Interesting. Okay. All right, Felicia. Okay. Next. This is not a question, um, but Barry Fallon from Facebook says, all patents should be removed from vaccines and medication. <laughs> uh. Good one. So let's ask about that. What's the, what's the ethics of having a cure for something? And maybe you spent a billion dollars for that first pill, mm-hmm. and, but now I want to recoup, but it's going to save lives. Well, let me take that apart. First, on the vaccine side... There's no drug company getting rich off vaccines. Okay. It's such a tiny, tiny piece of the profit pile. And a lot of companies, in fact, are abandoning making vaccines. Our real danger is that it's concentrated down to just four corporations on the planet that are really making vaccines because it's so low profit. On the drug side, we have another whole story. Okay. And without could be a another doubt, show, so maybe. Yeah, without a doubt. There's profiteering in the manufacture of pharmaceuticals, and you're going to have hearings on Capitol Hill about it. Mm -hmm. You're going to see that it's across the board politically. Everybody's mad about it. So we need some public health guidance. We need some ethical sense that doesn't completely remove the profit motive. There's got to be some middle ground in there. But, you know, here's the thing. When the people blame patents, and and believe me, I'm not a big defender, but when they blame patents, they fail to notice that right now the biggest profiteering skyrocketing is in the generics industry. You know, you all heard of that fellow Shkreli who's now gone to prison. Mm -hmm. Well, he was buying up generic manufacturing. It was off patent. All right, Felicia. Okay. Give it to me. This is my favorite question. Okay. Okay. It's from Daniel J. Saltzman from uh, Instagram. Can we create a vaccine to eliminate people that are against vaccines? 
<laughs> well, I'll take that as a rhetorical <laughs> question. <laughs> Whoa. Well, let's let's uh, add that to this one. But from Wilhelmina Van, um, I can't even pronounce her last name, D-I-J-K. Any guesses how you pronounce that? Yik. 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 Uh, from Facebook, can science ever undo the damage caused by the anti-vaxxers and their celebrity spokespeople? Well, that's very much like the very first yeah. question we had in the first uh, segment today because... Well, the first one was asking about policy, but now we're talking about popul the power of popularity right, as right. a face of a movement. You know, we have a lot of celebrities out there, you know, Jim Carrey and so on, they're anti-vaccine. What we don't have are a lot of very prominent celebrities coming out saying, yay, vaccinate your kids and let me show you my children. I've had each one of them vaccinated for everything according to doctors recommendations and that's a shame we could really use those voices mm. yeah that's life in general though they're always the naysayers they're never like the positive ones let's do this let's do this it's like let's not do this yeah right, right, they're right. always just the complainers i mean think about do you remember michelle bachman yeah mm -hmm. she ran for president of the united states mm -hmm. uh what three times ago three rounds ago and she claimed that the hpv vaccine which protected you against the virus that causes cervical cancer, uh, that that caused mental retardation. And she said that she, uh, in one of the presidential debates, she claimed she knew someone whose child had become, uh, had mongolism as a result of being vaccinated with HPV. Well, first of all, it's utterly ludicrous. That you don't develop uh, trisomy 21, a genetic disease as a result of a vaccine. And you were administering the vaccine at age 14. So are you saying that for 14 years, she was, you know, without Faking trisomy it. 21? <laughs> uh, but, it, but, uh, but it was utterly absurd. And in fact, a lot of the far right opposes the HPV vaccine, mainly because there's this crazy idea that if you're protected against a sexually transmissible disease, you'll go out and have more sex. You know, it's the same crazy notion that said you shouldn't use condoms or promote condoms because then everybody will go out there and have more sex because they have condoms. And that's why I'm not getting the what? HPV vaccine. Right. I don't have to go out there and have more sex. <laughs> and meanwhile, now we go all these years later and we can see all over the world a dramatic decline in cervical cancer. I mean, this vaccine has is the first genuine anti-cancer vaccine on the planet. And its efficacy is absolutely, I'm getting goosebumps even thinking about it mm. because I've lost, I lost a dear friend to cervical cancer. I watched her suffer and die. And if only that vaccine had been available just a few years earlier, she might have been with us today. People are afraid. I was afraid to give my kids the vaccine because you don't know, right? But what are you afraid of? It's new. You don't know the effects of it. Wait, wait, we're going to find out more of what she's afraid of after this break on Star Talk Cosmic Queries, the vaccine edition. When we return, Star Talk, we're back. Let's make America smart again. Cosmic Queries, vaccines. Lori Garrett, mm -hmm. always good to have you. It's got to have. We got to have you more. I love it. <laughs> Excellent. And Felicia, my co-host. First timer. The first timer. Excellent. I've been uh, unplugged. <laughs> you were just saying that you're you were resistant to vaccinating your kids against the human papillomavirus HPV. I was. I was very nervous, uh, mo mainly for my youngest one who had a um, had psoriasis, and they said that if you have an autoimmune disease, it could be dangerous. I've heard stories about who people. Who said that? Yeah, who said that? Where Friends. did you hear that? Friends. Yeah. Friends. See, people here you involved. Go. Uh, I've heard the internet. Yeah. A, a Facebook. Girl, a girl that had it. That had, a, Like you said, a reaction, which mm -hmm. could have been totally mm -hmm. I was just nervous for her. It kind of makes sense. If did, you have an did you end up doing it? I did. Good. And why? Um, I did a little research and everyone that I spoke to that was knowledgeable in the field said, well, I had one or two people that still said no, but I basically decided the risk outweighed. I, I joked around that I told my daughter. The benefits outweigh the risk. Yeah. I told my daughter that, you know, you can, if you have sex. The daughter's sex, the 16-year-old? The little one. Yes. And the older one said, if I, if, 
there's a vaccine that if you have sex before, you could die of cancer. And the doctor's busy for about six years so, oh, <laughs> mm-hmm. to keep her from having sex. Mm. <laughs> so how about your sons? So my son, then it came out that you should give it to your sons also. And I decided that he was older at the time. I let him make the decision. And the doctor was talking to him about it and telling him the risks. And he said it could prevent you from getting giving someone cancer. It could prevent you from getting cancer. He was undecided. And then he said, and, and it could prevent you from having... Um, warts on your balls. He's like, I'll get it. (laughs) (laughs) That's what made him decide to go forward with it. So cosmetic. He was like, okay, large warts on the balls. He's like, I'm going to have it. But but people were nervous. And I remember in my schools, there was a lot of controversy in meetings and people talking about it. And there were experts saying, you should definitely do it, definitely do it. And the detractors were saying that the doctors get paid by the pharmaceutical companies to push it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what we've seen worldwide is such a dramatic reduction in the numbers of women all over the world dying of cervical carcinoma. It's it's astronomical. And good you word know, on this program. Yeah. Astronomical. astronomical. <laughs> and, you know, when I was young and very, you know, a teenage a sexually active teenager, the only protection we had against cervical cancer um, other than trying to convince a partner to use a condom was getting routine pap smears. Well, the pap smear is actually detecting that you already have it. You know, So it's already showing that cells are beginning to transform, and at the very least you have what's called dysplasia, pre-cancer, in, in your cervix or cervical area. Um, so that's, that's like, oh, the horse is already running down the hill. You know, Somebody please lock up the barn. It's like the radiation badge you wear in nuclear power plants. Right. It's you, you hand it in and say, okay, you were exposed today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll die in 18 hours. No, thank you. Go into that badge <laughs> turned black. Happy news. <laughs> yeah. Whereas now people are tested for the presence of HPV viruses. And so you're actually f- not l- waiting to see, do you have transformed cells? You're waiting to see, do you, are you infected with the virus that will transform those cells and lead to cancer? And good news is we have a vaccine so that you don't even have to worry about it. There you go. And you have to get Next it, question. You have to get it before you have sex. So, Okay, Lee Daly from Facebook says, I've been hearing of children and teenagers asking doctors to be vaccinated without their parents knowing. Is it possible for doctors to do this or would it be considered unethical? So this these are is, presumably they're minors. At this yeah, point. Mm-hmm. And this is a new trend mm-hmm. where we only have anecdotal reports of it in various places around the United States and in Europe. Uh, but it does seem to be happening. And that is parents who refuse to vaccinate their children at the appropriate ages before age five. Now those kids are growing up. They're about to go off to college where they will be exposed and live in dorm rooms and so on with other kids that potentially could be carriers or they are carriers or they might expose the other kids. So these are kids who are more rational than their parents were. More rational than their parents Mm -hmm. and are uh, going to their pediatrician and saying, I want the shots. But if they're 12, can a pediatrician do that? No, the pediatrician is going to have to have a long conversation with the parents. Okay, so at age 18, can they do it? Yes, in most states. And in fact, in many states, at 16, they can do it. Okay. It just depends on the state law. All right. It's All probably right, too you. late for many of these kids if their parents are anti-vaxxers, right? You know, it's what, one of the things I say to parents that express doubts. Is I say, do you really think that when your child is 20 years old and now is ready to has wanderlust and wants to travel and do the thing that kids do in college, travel and go, let's go to Morocco and check out Algeria and Casablanca and blah, blah, blah. Do you really think they're going to say, thanks a lot, mom and dad, for making me vulnerable to every single darn disease I'm going to be exposed to because you refuse to let me get vaccinated? Okay, this is from JTR Machine from Instagram. What is a measles? What is a measles? That's what he Good said. question. <laughs> what, what is, is, going, what is measles? What, I'll, I'll measles. re-ask the question. When you get the measles, what the hell is going on in your body? Wow, that's a really great question because measles um, is so contagious and we have so much history that we know a great deal about what it does to the human body. Me- when measles gets in, you inhale it. It very quickly goes through your lungs and into your bloodstream. So it is you know, almost immediately systemic. But here's the really tricky thing that makes it so hard to conquer it. 
uh, you can be infected and have no symptoms for a couple of weeks. Ooh, so you're, you're a carrier. You're a carrier, and you don't know it. You're not being a bad person. You just don't know. It's being an awesome virus. It's an awesome <laughs> virus, right, right? Because it it takes care of its host for a really long time. Because if, if it killed you instantly, it wouldn't be able to spread itself, right? Well, that's why Ebola. That's we why have, we have yet to have a world epidemic of Ebola because you are immediately debilitated. You're mm-hmm. so sick. You're not out tromping around. Mm-hmm. And in the case of measles, people. Wait, wait, can, so it means the the best viruses. From a human survival standpoint, are the most deadly. They're well. The best, sentence? the best viruses from their own perspective. No, no, I'm talking about from my perspective. Oh yeah, you, super deadly. M- rabies, rabies. In the absence of vaccine, rabies is 100 percent deadly to humans. Mm-hmm. To right? all mammals, even. In all yeah. mammals. Yeah, yeah. So you get exposed, you die, and mm-hmm. it's fast. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to give it to anybody else because right. you're dead on the floor. Right. You're, right, you're right. dead, and you have to bite them. Oh, and it. you have to bite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's a kind of you vampire virus. You have to be infected and cannibalistic. Right, right. Okay. God. Um, but, it, it, okay, so what is measles? So the first symptoms of measles would be very hard to distinguish because it's fever, it's malaise, it's achy muscle, all the stuff that is like, oh, I have the flu. It's similar. Um, until you get the distinctive red splotches, which is petechia. And this is because your capillaries are responding to the virus. And you get these little tiny red, and then the red splotches join, and then they look like big red, you know, I'm getting all itchy listening to you describe this. Yes. I'm examining my body. <laughs> I know. Yeah, she's Wait, I think I saw something earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have what's called medical student disease. Oh, is that it? They get As everything they, they learn study? about it, they start feeling it. Yeah, no, I'm itching now. Mm. <laughs> And um, and then at that point, you're feverish and you're down for the count, you know, and you're just going to tough it out. And it really is just, is your immune system able to muster a response or not? When I was a child, I had measles and it was before there were vaccines readily available. I had chicken pox. I had uh, rubella and rubiola. Uh, so I went through the list. And in every Don't case, like ice cream flavors, rubella, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and they were miserable experiences. Mm-hmm. I mean, anybody that tries to minimize it has just never been around it. Measles. I remember being so delirious that uh, mother would come in to the bedroom, and I wasn't sure it was her or a ghost or Ooh. some image from somewhere you know i uh, she would speak to me and i couldn't hear and that's another thing that people don't think about they they look at something like measles and think it's either lethal or not lethal well there's you know the measles used to be the number one cause of profound deafness in america and a very high percentage of people who get measles will have permanent hearing loss it also kills brain cells, and a lot of people will find that they are uh, permanently intellectually impaired by having suffered from measles. Wait, but you had measles. Yeah. So I, apparently, it, I if, came if it okay. created brain damage, well, maybe so it you, did. you might have had two Pulitzer prizes by now. <laughs> <laughs> now you're just an idiot. You only yeah, got one. I won't get political right now. But there's probably a lot well, I was a finalist two other times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, and yeah. shingles, like shingles is the, everyone's questioning whether to get the shingles vaccine. Oh, get it. I've had shingles. Ooh, ow, awful. I hear it's terrible, oh, right? Oh my goodness. I'm shingles vaccinated. Well, I, I had shingles. I, I was, it was in 1983. I had heard Miss that. She remembers the day, date, time. <laughs> no, it's I horrible. really, I really do because I was, I was very young for getting measles. I mean, uh, shingles. It's usually considered a problem for seniors. Um, but I was um, covering the first documented cases of babies with AIDS. And this is in that the very early days of the AIDS epidemic. There you go. And the tragedy I was seeing living for weeks among screaming, crying children for whom we had no treatment, nothing, and seeing them separated from their dying parents on another ward. And it was so traumatic, I I came down with profound shingles, and it went right up my spinal cord. And believe me, you do not want shingles. So your immune system was compromised in your emotional state. Yes. There it was. Mm, I didn't know that's how you get it. Because the chickenpox virus hides in your nerve cells. And so, hence, it's opportunistic when you get older. Yes. When you are more susceptible. Yes, and it's opportunistic when you're under high stress. Mm. 
Another reason for me to stay calm. Okay, let's hear. All right, from let's do lightning round. Woo! Okay, now your answers have to be really sound short. bites. Okay, but I don't know if the, you can do that. Do you, have, <laughs> do, do you have this power? I do. We'll be the judge of that. Okay, okay. Well, this is a long question. Felicia, go. Too long okay. question. You got to pick short. Okay, I, I don't have any short ones left. Okay, Arlene Kunder, I'll talk fast. Have to be short. Okay, okay StarTalkRadio.net. There is now an AI that can check to see if a baby is autistic at six months old with ninety six percent accuracy. If this AI can predict autism at six months old at a ninety six percent rate, but vaccines aren't given until twelve months old, doesn't this completely kill the notion that vaccines cause autism? Yeah. Yes. There you go. Well, okay. That was quick. Okay, give it a good. This is from Firecat711 uh, Instagram. That was, that was a sound bite. You, that was you, great. You get, <laughs> no question about that one. that one. She was no doubt on that. Okay, given the current trend of people moving away from vaccines, how do you approach anti vaxxers? I live in an area with a high concentration of anti vaxxers and I'm finding it increasingly difficult to sway their opinions. Tell them that by not vaccinating their children, they're putting your children at risk and that that is not a fair way to participate in democracy or be part of a community. Mm. Grace 22 Burroughs, Instagram. Why aren't all vaccines 100 percent effective? Oh, goodness. That's a hard one to do really short. But let's just say it has to do with the nature of the kind of immune response that would be properly mounted in order to defeat that microbe. So uh, let me follow up. Are there any vaccines that are 100%? Um, well, the Ebola vaccine looks to be 100%. Nice. And what's the vaccines that's sort of the lowest percent, would you say? Influenza. Influenza. That's because it's not matching the right that's virus. That's because two problems. It's not matching the right virus that's circulating. Uh -huh. And it's your inherent immune system memory, which is against whatever was the first form of flu you were exposed to as a baby. Mm. I have a question about flu because someone said if you get the vaccine and it's the same strand, how come you're not immune to it the second time around? Why do you have to get the f flu vaccine Because again? it never is the same. Yeah, never the same. But it has it constantly come back the changes. Same. Well, no, what, no, no, it'll be a f the same family. So like you, we might say there's an H1N1 flu circulating. I hope not. But, and, <laughs> and you Isn't might, that the 1918 flu? <laughs> yes. Yeah, too, okay. and, so you, and you might have been exposed to H1N1 when it came through in 2009 which was that huge global pandemic we had, right? But School canceled. But it's a different H1N1. So your immune system only partially recognizes it. All right. Okay. Next question. Merle at Merle from Twitter. What is the difference between a disease being eliminated and eradicated? Ah, I love that. Ooh. Eliminated means it's, you know, not in circulation. I didn't even know to ask that question. That's great. A smart person. That's good. Mm -hmm. So eliminated is it's not in circulation in your given community, state, nation, how, whatever group you're defining. Eradicated, and we only have eradicated one human pathogen, smallpox, means it doesn't exist on planet Earth anymore. Ooh. Except in laboratories. So people aren't under lock, uh, vaccinated under lock anymore. And key. For it? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Okay, cool. right. I was vaccinated. One, I'm one old last. enough to be vaccinated. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Is that got the, the scar. one that you have? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. You're too Why young. Why do we not get that? I have you're a scar. You're too young. Scar. Okay, that ends the lightning oh. round. Lori, uh, thanks for coming back. Yeah. My gosh, I mean, I, I don't like having you on the show because it's about stuff that makes me itch and scratch, <laughs> and, and it's always, uh, it's always. Uh, apocalyptic <laughs> but we need you it's important in spite of this yeah so Felicia where are you most active on social media uh, Instagram and Facebook okay uh, Felicia Madison comedian on both but we can find you yes. easily and uh, do you tweet oh I do ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh. excuse me a lot excuse me and, and your Twitter handle at Lori underscore Garrett we got it I'm, we got I'm it. We'll following you right now. We'll be looking for both of you. This has been Star Talk, a Let's Make America Smart Again edition, all about vaccines. I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and I thank Lori and Felicia. And maybe we can do this again when the next disease <laughs> that we have to eradicate comes up. Uh, so as always, can I we bid you. Eradicate stupidity. <laughs> can you eradicate <laughs> stupidity? Ooh. Good one. <laughs> As always, I bid you to keep looking up.